is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Snowbike Mike, here with episode eight of the Kind of Funny X Cast, your home for all things Xbox at Kind of Funny. Of course, I am joined by one of my incredible, stupendous, and radical co hosts, Gary Witta. Gary Witta, what's going on? It's been some time. I miss you, my guy. I'm glad to be back. I know I had to skip last week. I had a I had a conflict, um, but I'm back. I'm back, and now right. Of course, now I'm back. And Alana has uh, been laid out. Poor, poor. Let's everyone please send best wishes to Alana. She's laid out with a um, a migraine that hit her pretty hard this afternoon. So we're all hoping she feels better soon. No doubt. Send some positive energy over there to our second co-host, Alana Pierce, who is feeling under the weather, and we hope that she makes a speedy recovery back on her feet to play some games this weekend. So. In her place, you will be hearing a voice from the ether. That is our producer, the one, the only, Barrett Courtney. What's going on, Big Boss? How are you, Barrett? I'm doing. I'm doing well, Mike. Uh, just been, just been hanging out, playing a lot of like almost too many video games. I will say, uh, nothing no on such Xbox. Thing. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I do not own an Xbox. I'm. I feel ashamed to admit that on the Xcast, but. <laughs> that was uh, uh, you know, just uh, playing a bunch, playing like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, juggling that with like, uh, I've been addicted to Among Us, which is like a video game version of like a uh, werewolf or mafia, if you understand what that means. Uh, then Marvel's Avengers, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2. There, there's too much right now, Snowbike Mike. Break it down so for me. What's going on? Much, Barrett. And we have a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about all those games because this is the kind of funny X cast. And we'd love to start with a fun icebreaker conversation, get everybody talking. And this week, I want to dial in. I want to focus, Barrett, on our guy, Gary Witta. Because Gary Witta has been hosting talk shows left and right. He's on TNT. He's on TBS. He's on ABC. He's on YouTube. No, really, he's everywhere. But, Gary, I have one question for you. You love all these video game talk shows. You've done one in Animal Crossing. You've done one in Fall Guys. Let's focus on Xbox, Gary. If you had the choice, what first-party Xbox game would you make a talk show in? I feel like I could do something with flight sim, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, you want, you want something, you know, you're up in the air, you know, get, get on a transatlantic flight, put it on autopilot and you got nothing to do, but pass the time and have a, you know, pass the time with some, with some good solid conversation. Maybe that, maybe, maybe that's the, maybe that's the, the future. I'm trying to think what else there would be first party Xbox game that would be good for, um, for for chat, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with flight sim because I feel like that again. That's that's a game where you know you can the the game can kind of take a back seat a little bit. You know, put it on like like I said, put it on autopilot. Let the let the game do the flying for you, and just concentrate on some uh, on some on some good uh, good quality chit chat. Maybe maybe that maybe that's the third coming of the video game talk show. We got we we've, we've done um, <laughs> we've done Animal Crossing. And that's the thing because we because you know, when you think about it, Mike, you make a good point. Animal Crossing Nintendo exclusive. Fall Guys, for right now at least, on a console is a PlayStation exclusive. Where's the X where's the Xbox exclusive talk show platform? I, I, I might have to check that box now that you mention it. That's I am looking point. at you. And I will say, Gary, that's a good selection right there. I can imagine me and Barrett Courtney were sitting in the back of the plane. Pilot Gary comes on and goes, Everybody, put your seat up to the upright position and lock yep. your tray tables. I got a great story for you. And we're just right. chatting and having fun on a nice flight. I have some other options for you as well because all right, I'm, you know, I'm, we're I'm all about is. Xbox here. Grounded. You, three others, creating <laughs> a house, surviving, battling off spiders. I think that could lead to a fun talk. You show. know what we could call it, Mike? Small talk. Hell yeah. Okay. Gary. <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good it's one, Gary. I like pay that. pay me the big bucks. I'll give you two more because they're easy. Of course, Minecraft. The ability to create unique and awesome places with somebody, see their creativity, their mind come out and play, or see a thieves. We could all get on the boat, sing some sea shanties, and have a great time. So, two good options. My final one, Gary, though, this is the one. Go this on. is the option. I want you to host a talk show in a Gears Five Horde mode. You must complete all fifty layer, all oh, fifty wow. levels. I would love to see the autopilot mode through the first. 10 to 15, maybe 20, where everybody's doing the thing. It's easy. We're talking. And then I would like to see the ramp up of when it goes from conversation to, oh, this is actual gameplay. I'm trying to figure out my active reloads. I'm putting down different traps and barriers, and we're trying to survive. And we ditched the talk show. That's you know, how it like, me. The, even the That's a great idea. But even the talk show of it aside, what you've really reminded me is I seriously need to get into, into Gears 5 Horde mode. As I've said on this show before, some of the greatest memories I've ever had video gaming online multiplayer 
uh, was was horde mode on the 360. I loved, loved, loved playing that game. I got to get back into it. I think the idea, again, the whole point of talk, guys, like it, you know, it, it's hard, right? Like trying to have a carry on a conversation while playing a game that is constantly demanding your full attention. Um, horde mode is also a game that constantly demands uh, your full attention. Maybe you and I, maybe I, maybe you and I could uh, shoot a pilot episode of that. Let's do it. Pilot episode, little Twitch stream. I think people would love it, Gary. We'll look into that one. Let's jump into what we've been playing. Barrett, you took me back to the old school just a little bit ago. So why don't you kick us off? Let's talk about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 Remastered now being available to everybody. What's your early impressions? Well, uh, just a correction, Mike. It's a remake. This is uh, from, the ground, uh, from the ground <laughs> up. Vicarious Visions pouring their uh, blood, sweat, and tears into bringing a very iconic uh, game series back into the modern age with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. Um, and, and I know I, I've said this before and people get upset whenever I say this about like a remaster or remake. Um, I, I have I don't remember playing a lot of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. Like I was a little on the younger side when those games came out. I I sort of came in at like probably right before Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 came out and then going into Pro Skater 4 and then Thug 1 and Thug 2. Thug 1 and 2 are like my my mainstays in the Tony Hawk series. Um but yeah there is something special about this remake and it's Tim Gettys nails uh nails it on the head uh, whenever he talks about this game is that Vicarious Visions looked at like what needed to um what needed to stay from the originals and what needed to be updated. And they did such a smart, uh, pick and choose of what to do there. Um, like the, the move set, right? The, the kind of standard move set in the game, you can change it, uh, back to the classic one and two, uh, game move sets, but, uh, they chose to go more of along, uh, along the move set style of pro skater three and four, which is, uh, what a lot of people agree is kind of like the, the pinnacle of how Tony Hawk games felt, uh, with a uh, revert. And I think I, I, I'm hazy on whether if flatland and like manual stuff was, uh, uh, introduced in two or three, um, but all of that's available um, from from the get go. Just playing uh, the the first two games, and of course, if you're a purist out there, you can uh, change it back to the the old school stuff if you really want to. Um, but this is just it, it's such a fun time, and it's crazy to think that we have not gotten a good Tony Hawk game in a little over thirteen years. The the series used to come out. This used to this was like the original yearly release almost for Activision. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it, it's such like a um, feels so good and nostalgic to go back. But it also in and of itself, it's just really fun to play still to this day, even though uh, like the campaigns for both games are pretty much the, the same with little added things here and there. Uh, Vicarious Visions also like want the extra uh, kind of step to also add some of their own challenges and kind of even if you beat the campaigns for both games in uh, like a day or two, there's still so much that Vicarious added of their own stuff that uh, kind of feeds into their, their leveling system and uh, being able to purchase a uh, cosmetic items all with in game, like uh, earned money and stuff like that. Like Tim, before launch, Tim and I were worried about like microtransaction stuff, but it doesn't seem like, really any system is going to be laid out for that at all. Like it's all within its own system, which is great. Uh, and so, yeah, like they, they built so much to keep you coming back, uh, going through these challenges, unlocking uh, a couple of the uh, hidden characters and stuff like that, which is what I'm focused on uh, currently at the moment is just like getting through some of these real tough challenges of, uh, of, of one of the crazy ones is like, there's like the pro score, the, the high score, the pro score and the six score. And one of the challenges is get a combo that's higher than the six score on like six to uh, I, I, it's either six or 11 uh, levels, which is like insane. Um, with some of some of the levels I can easily do it, but then there's some like, Oh man, this is going to be a challenge. So yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot here with this remake. And I think vicarious visions is, uh, proven once again, when it comes to games from the nineties, they know what the fuck they're doing. Uh, mm. their first one being, uh, the crash bandicoot insane trilogy which uh, also had a lot of uh, labor of love in, in that game. And I, I think this is going to be, the, I, I don't know if they want to go this route of being like the, the remake team for nineties nostalgia stuff. Uh, I would love if they followed this up with a thug one and two remake, but that's, I know that's a pie in the sky idea, but um, they are really, 
they're they're the remake team and they know what the hell they're doing and they they know what they're fans of and they know what uh what they can pull off and i think uh because of that they're just gonna keep kind of flying higher and higher with whatever they want to do in the future yeah no doubt barrett that's some really good insight and you actually blew my mind because i did not know vicarious visions did this and now that you say that it's like oh yeah you can see it clear as day the tender love and care that was put into this because it is a ton of fun I love the new addition of the new skaters. I love going back and remembering the days and like being on the school playground and going, okay, where are the school bells that I have to hit right now? Or which picnic tables do I need to grind on? It's a total blast. So I totally agree. They've done a terrific job. When I play this, my issue is, is I'm just not a combo guy. I'm more of a skate dude. I like the flow. And when I play this, I think, man, this is a ton of fun, but I want skate for. But if you fair. are into this game, if you are a ride or die combo breaker setting the highest scores. They've done a terrific job with this and you should definitely check it out. Gary Witta, when I look at you, I say Gary Witta's a skater. Okay, elbow pads, wrist guards. <laughs> He's got the helmets. Are you dropping in the half pipe with Tony Hawk? Tell me, Birdman, what are you doing over there, Gary? This this is one that doesn't um, actually hold a particular nostalgic appeal to me because I never never really got into the first games. I'm acutely aware of them and their and their place in history. When I was editor in chief of PC Gamer back in the um, in the late '90s, we were right across the hall from Next Generation, which was the console magazine, and I would often go over there to see like what you know what, what what's happening you know over in the console space with these crazy kids. And uh, I remember when Tony Hawk One came into the office on PlayStation Two. And it blew everyone away. It's for some reason I, I specifically remember this one weirdly weird thing that you could plug in a USB keyboard and actually text chat with other players online. And at the time we were like, "What? You can do that? What? This is the future. This is amazing!" Like this, they all all felt very very new to us. Um, uh, and it's been it's it's an interesting franchise to uh, reflect on historically. I think you touched on earlier, Mike, um, Activision really kind of straggled the golden goose here right they had a they had a tremendously successful franchise and just like they do with all their big franchises just like they did with guitar hero and a bunch of others they got greedy how many of these can we put out how much can we you know how, how much uh money can we squeeze out of this franchise and of course they overdid it um call of duty is really the only franchise they've ever done that with that has survived that process call of duty you know again regular yearly updates but they have actually managed to kind of keep that fresh each each uh you know modern warfare uh is one thing but call of duty cold war feels like a very different experience and they've actually managed to keep their prime cash cow uh fit and healthy but they have man they have managed to strangle pretty much every golden goose they've ever had over there at Activision. Remember Guitar Hero when that was a big deal? They drove that right into the ground. They they way overdid it. And Tony Hawk, too, I think, you know, that that was, I mean, Tony Hawk was the biggest thing for, for a long time. And then the, I don't know if it was like greed or just like a series of kind of creative missteps. Like, remember Ride, the thing that shipped with the fucking skateboard? Oh, that, in my mind, Gary. I was <laughs> just going to bring that up. That. Just an embarrassment. Like, it didn't, <laughs> how did that product even ship? It didn't fucking work. Barrett, did you ever play that thing? No, you ever stand that, up? That, like, uh, I, I, I want to <laughs> look up when did Tony Hawk Ride come out? Because uh, the last Tony Hawk game I even remember playing was. Project Eight, and I think that was like two thousand six. Yeah, Ride didn't come out until two thousand nine. And then so, they yeah. tried to get the franchise back on track. What was the most recent one? Was it Five? Yeah, it was Pro Skater Five, which I don't and that know was not seen. well received yeah. either, if I recall. Uh, yeah, correctly, that was a shit right? show. So I think I think Activision. This this might be the beginning of like a smart play. Like back, let's go back to basics. Let's go back to the beginning. Like you know, the Tony Hawk franchise. Forgive the pun has gone off the rails. Right? It's not. It's not. <laughs> Man, you can tell it's Friday <laughs> afternoon. No one I gives love a fuck. It. I love um, it. And and so that, okay, look, they understand that Tony Hawk is still one of their prime licenses, right? It's a big, it's still a big deal for Activision. There's still a lot, as we as we're clearly seeing now, still a lot of affection out there for that game. And I think you know the idea of going back to the original one and two, the ones that people still hold in the highest regard, certainly the most nostalgic affection for the original two games. And given them a, and it sounds like they did a really great job with this with this remake, kind of capturing everything that people loved about the originals. The, the, so congratulations to Activision and Vicarious Visions on a very very successful way to revisit you know the the nostalgia of the original two games. Sounds like they nailed it. The question is. 
to you, Mike, and also especially to Barrett, because it sounds like you're really clued into the Tony Hawk games. Do you think that Activision can take this success and parlay it into a successful reboot of the Tony Hawk series as a whole, which would mean you can't just, they, they can't just go back and remake every game. At some point, they've got to, you know, strike out on their own and bring us a new Tony Hawk game. Can they do that? I think, can they really re reinvigorate the franchise and not just revisit, hmm. you know, past glories? Hmm. I'm going to point to Baird on this one because for me, I'm a skate guy. I don't think it would hold a candle to skate in the upcoming generation, which we're going to see with Skate 4. But I think there is a true diehard audience for this. I think Baird will state a case of why this, why they should maybe possibly double down on this. And to be clear, I, I, I love both franchises and I totally understand, like, uh, not, like, not. Both is aren't going to be for everybody. Tony Hawk uh, Pro Skater is more of like the, the guitar hero, and Skate is more of the rock band kind of thing, right? One is one is the combo stuff. One is more of a trying to be like a a, a fun simulator. Um, I would say, like, honestly, I I, I th I'm going to contradict you a little bit, Gary. Is that I I think the next best thing they could do is I don't know if it looks like DLC or if they do like a, their own entries but like to add more into this remake of maybe adding levels from Pro Skater 3 and 4 to to keep that nostalgia going because again like those um, those games and levels from those games are uh, really loved so I could see there may be being room uh, to build on this game and uh, to maybe add some DLC from oh sure Pro I don't think I don't, I, I don't think this is the end but like that yeah. can't be their long-term strategy right they can't yeah. just live in the past yeah. forever at some point they have to bring something new to the table again yeah i i think the most i see them doing uh before maybe going and trying to do like new uh iterations of the franchise which i think would uh would be interesting and would be cool especially with uh this game they <clears throat> even introduced like they brought back all the old skaters like chad muska who i think retired from skateboarding like 10 uh, more than 10 years ago uh that like he he's in this game still uh you got my boy rodney mullen but then they also brought in like a new generation of skaters uh to be able to play as in uh these games like you got uh riley hawk um uh, you have like the the first trans pro skateboarder in this game, which is fucking awesome. Um, uh, so they've got this new generation. So I think there is room for them to eventually uh, start making uh, new Tony Hawk iterations and not just doing it like uh, remasters, remakes, whatever. Yeah, um, and uh, to I show, mean, I, I mean, I, like, I, I, not just for the the newness of it, but also like uh, start showcasing the new generation of skateboarders who I don't think n have nearly gotten the spotlight as uh, the the old generation. And they got that spotlight because of these games, right? Yeah, uh, listen, so. I mean, I think I think that they have very successfully kind of reset the narrative and the public per perception of the Tony Hawk franchise, which is that, you know, like I said, he had gone off the rails. The last couple of games were not well received. It was like, oh, Tony Hawk, remember, you remember that series that used to be good but hasn't been in a long time? Mm -hmm. they've, they've hit the reset button on that successfully, right, which is great. The last Tony, the most recent Tony Hawk, it's like Tony Hawk's good again. Now, yes, they had to go back to the, to, to, to the original games and remake them, in order for that to happen. But why not? That's great. You know, we, we love a bit of nostalgia. And let's not forget, Barrett, you just touched on this. It's not just a nostalgia trip for everyone. There's a whole generation of kids that have grown up for whom this will oh, be yeah. the first Tony Hawk game. And, this, and, and what a great way to be introduced, not just reintroduced, but introduced to this franchise. I love it. Let's bring skateboarding back. But on top of that, we're talking old school. Let's talk new school. Gary Witter, you have been gone for like two weeks and I've missed you a lot. You left and we were playing Might... Microsoft Flight Simulator, Battletoads, Wasteland 3. Tell me why from Don't Nod. So why don't you tell me, what have you been playing, Gary? What's the new hot setup over in that awesome studio of yours? On the Xbox side, uh, I've got a bunch of stuff, you know, because like, it's not you have to understand, Mike, it's not easy for me. I'm a dad. I've got an eight-year-old kid that's constantly bouncing off the walls because she can't go to school. Uh, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard out here for, a, for a, you know, all the gaming parents listening to this podcast right now. I know are nodding along going, I feel your pain, Gary, because it's not easy. Um, but Wasteland, so the, the, the next up on my list is definitely Wasteland 3. I've actually got it installed both on PC and on my Xbox right now. Of course, that's the beauty of Game Pass. They get it on both, uh, uh, both platforms uh, equally. Wasteland 3, I'm definitely going to be diving into. Um, Flight Sim is, is high on the agenda. Now, Mike, I've got, I've got an update for you on the Flight Sim front. Very exciting update. And I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of show. If you listen to the audio podcast version of this, I'm afraid you're going to miss out. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to get the full experience. I had been belly aching about how I wanted to play Flight Sim and my daughter's really into it as well. But like 
we felt like we were missing out because I didn't. I had a flight stick that was an old PS2 flight stick that didn't work with my current motherboard. And like, I really want to play with like the you know the real flight hardware. Someone out there at Microsoft, you know, again, I know we have a few fans of the KFX over at Microsoft. Next thing I know, I got a little care package on my doorstep. And uh, you want to see some of the stuff that I got sent? Heck yeah, Gary. I'll speak for everybody. We all want to see the cool, awesome stuff. I got to show you. Okay, so they sent me three things. Each one I'm going to show you in in, in order of size. I'm going to show you the smallest box. I haven't even unboxed this yet. I'm going to do this this weekend, and we're going to do some weekend flights. First of all, I got this very nice – let me hold this up for you. It's a very nice throttle. This is the Logitech Flight Throttle Quadrant. And what will that thing? be used for? Let, let, let's deep dive into it. what's that going to be used for, the throttle there, Gary? What it's do you got think three, that's going to be got three, It's got three levers on it. I have no idea what any of them do. One's black, one's blue, and one's red. <laughs> so make of that what you will. Okay, um, okay. It says here, multi-engine aircraft can sometimes leave you a couple of throttles short. Three extra levers control even more engines, flaps, gear, spoilers, and Dang. any other pro- programmable axes you want to assign. So that's this dope. can do all kinds of things, apparently. Like so I got that. this throttle. Okay. Take a look at this bad boy, Mike. Oh, my God. Oh, he has to use two hands. This is the yoke. This is the yoke. This is from a company called Honeycomb Aeronautical. Alpha flight controls, uh, yoke and switch panel. This is like, I mean, this looks like it should be in a fucking Airbus A320 or something. Look at this. Look at this thing, Mike. Are you seeing this? This thing's nuts. I'm excited to see you strap that to your desk. Eight-way hat switch, two buttons. Universal pa- uh, panel mounting system, ignition switch, adjustable cockpit backlighting, solid steel shaft with dual linear ball bearings and 180 degree yoke rotation, master avionics and light switches. Look at this thing. It looks like, it looks like they just ripped this out of a fucking 747. <laughs> Look at I mean, this bad does. boy. Yeah, it does. Are There's you kidding no me with this? <laughs> All right. And then one, I got to, and now I've saved the most ridiculous thing. For last. I don't even know if I can even fucking lift this up and put it on camera. This is like a two-man lift. Hold on. Oh, oh, Proper lifting the, techniques. This is the Thrustmaster TPR Pendula yeah. Rudder. I don't know. These I are pedals. Know that is. I these, <laughs> are ru- these are rudder pedals that go under your desk. You know what it looks like, Mike? It looks like one of those little stationary cycles that you can yep. ride while you're at your exactly. desk. Yep. Except it's a rudder. It's a flight system. So, you know, my – look at this fucking thing. This – basically, my, my PC desk here is very shortly going to become like a fully featured cockpit. So I'm very excited about this. And thank you to Microsoft for sending me all this ridiculous stuff. I mean, I, my, my flight sim experience, my, uh, my cup runneth over. It's, I it's, it's, I'm about to take it to the next level, Mike. I got two questions for you. Yeah. One, question number one. Do you think all of that equipment will allow you to do sick barrel rolls and awesome flips in the aircraft better than me on a controller? Better than you? I don't know, Mike. I mean, not better are... than me, but like, would it elevate my barrel roll experience? Because I don't, I'm know, I don't know if you'll be able. I don't know if you'll right? be able to do things that you can't do on a controller. I just think that you know the whole point of these things is to create that 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 sense of, and I'm going to use one of my favorite words here, verisimilitude. You want that sense, Mike, of verisimilitude. You want to feel like you're in a real plane, right? Like it's more, it's more fun to play a driving game with a wheel, right? Because it feels like you feel like you're really driving the car. And when Star Wars Squadrons come out, comes out, I'm gonna want a real flight stick to play that with too. Cause you wanna you wanna you know map that experience one to one as close as you can. So the idea of having a fly a control yoke that you're actually kind of pulling up and pushing back, um, and you know, and, and just you know, just the sense of you know, hitting the throttle. Like, let me ask you this, Mike. You're an Xbox guy. You ever play Steel Battalion with that yeah. ridiculous? Like, you, how much I mean, fun with that I've ridiculous with controller? That, yeah, that was all yeah, part. That was a cool. massive part. Of would the, be cool. Not the same game without that controller, right? The controller was such a part of that experience. That I mean, you know, that, I mean, you, you've seen some of the, these hardcore flight. Like, the stuff that I've got here, like this is this is fucking baby mode compared to what some flight sim <laughs> hardcore. I mean, they they've built like entire cockpits in their in their basements and stuff like they really go all out um so i'm, I'm looking forward to, to playing with some of this hardware over the weekend we're, we're going to see what it can do number two how good are you at cord management and controlling your desk environment because now you have three gigantic pieces that you're going to strap to the front oh, back you- and underneath your desk when does when do we see gary witta 
come up to the table and just start kicking things and moving things out the way in front of me. I mean, it's already, a, it's already fucking Spaghetti Junction down there, Mike. You don't want to see under my desk. It's a horror show. One of the reasons why I never post pictures of my setup is because I don't want the 50 fucking smart Alex going, oh, cord management. Fuck off. Like, yes, my cords are a mess. They, they, you know, just I know that people like to do the little twisty ties and, oh, look, you know, and it's, it's, it, I get it. It's nice, right? When you have a setup where it looks like there's no cords and everyone has like, yeah, and, you, and you've got it all. But the, the closest I'm ever going to come to cord management is like just getting like a big fucking baseboard and shoving it up there. So like all the, like, as long as you don't see it. My mother always used to say, Mike, what the eye doesn't see, the heart doesn't grieve over. And as long as, as long as, as long as I'm not seeing it, as long as it's out of my out of my sight, yeah, I don't. Yeah, of course the cords are there, but like I don't know. I mean, what about you, Mike? What 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 is it? Is it is it a, a is it a bad situation under your desk? Is there a lot uh, of cords running rampant? Yes, it's a currently a bad situation under my desk because Greg Miller, CEO of Kind of Funny, has forced me to play a PlayStation Four game with him, and I don't oh, have my PlayStation Four in this setup. So now it's actually I'm straddling the PlayStation Four under the desk because I don't have enough room for it. It's a mess. You know what? This show is a mess as well. We're having too much fun. It's Friday. Gary, I'm going to hold you to that flight simulator. Bear, oh, we're doing it. Keep grinding, and we need to move forward and get into housekeeping and get into some topics. So some housekeeping news for you. The X-Cast posts each and every Saturday at 6 a.m. Pacific time on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games and podcast services around the globe. Remember, we are a new show. It's only episode eight, so do me a favor. Share this with everybody you know. Let's continue to push Kind of Funny X-Cast. Let's continue to make Greg Miller say, yes, I'm proud of Gary, Alana, Barrett, and Mike. So thank you so much for the love. Remember to re leave a review on your favorite podcast service and subscribe to that podcast service, where, of course, you can find all things Kind of Funny by just typing in Kind of Funny into the search bar. And then, of course... This is weekend number three coming up, y'all. Xbox weekends at Kind of Funny continue to roll on, Gary. That's right. The Kind of Funny X cast on Saturday and Greg Miller's first ever Halo Combat Evolved playthrough is going posted every single week, one level per week. We're going to be on level three this Sunday, so make sure to tune in and enjoy your Kind of Funny Xbox weekend. That's your housekeeping. Let's jump right into it. We're going to check the dashboard, and I saved what I've been playing this week for our big topic, and that is one of the biggest smash hits of the week, Marvel's Avengers from Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to play a fun game, you guys. So I'm going to have Barrett and Gary in this one. Gary, I'm actually going to hold for a second before we play a fun game, and I bring in the topic for everybody, how it relates to Xbox. But really quick, Gary, what's your thoughts so far on Marvel's Avengers? Are you having a smash hit time? So I so I, I talked about I talked about this to to um, Greg when I did kind of funny uh, games daily with him uh, earlier in the week. Um, when they first, I had a weird trajectory with this game. It's been down and then it's been up, and now it's even. I think and, and now it's kind of I don't know what the future holds, but like I'm very optimistic about Avengers right now. And the narrative has been interesting across the board. When they first rolled it out, I was very skeptical, and the reason for that was. The aesthetic that they chose for the game, which is, you know, kind of CG, but very like, you know, they didn't go for like a cartoony Ultimate Alliance type look, right? They went for the photorealistic, like, let's make this kind of look like the MCU, but CG. And the problem is when you, when you, when, when you invite comparisons to the MCU, you're going to give yourself a very you know, tough mountain to climb, right? Because the MCU is, that's, that's the gold standard, right? When you think about Iron Man, you think about RDJ, you're thinking about, you know, you're thinking about Chris Evans as Captain America, you're thinking about Scarlett Johansson, you're thinking about that tone that they established over the course of those 20 or so movies. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough thing to go up against. And they, it feels like they invited that comparison by going for a very similar aesthetic. And I think it, it rubbed me and a lot of people the wrong way because like when Captain America walks onto the screen, you kind of go, Who, who's this fucking guy? Like Chris Evans' stunt double? Like, like, what is this? I feel like you're walking down the Hollywood Walk of Fame with all these like fucking knockoff characters like pestering you to take their photograph, take, you know, like pay me five bucks to take a picture with this like slightly overweight fucking <laughs> Superman. Like, what's going on? Like, I'm, this is not what I want. It's a like dollar store Avengers. Like, what, what is going on? I'm not happy. And I, and I, and a lot of people had that same, 
I would, say, I would say like i still kind of feel that way gary even if <laughs> and i'm enjoying the story <laughs> i'm enjoying the story but the actual like the avengers team that we see in that game is so just like the most generic version of avengers i've ever right. seen what makes it interesting is viewing this story from the lens of kamala khan like uh, when they yeah. first revealed this game, like there was almost no mention of Kamala. And then uh, like a, a trailer, I want to say like a couple months after uh, showed off her character and her being a main character. And uh, a lot of people were like, oh, that, that's cool. Why didn't they show that uh, originally when they were like kind of fully revealed the game? I'm not talking about the teaser from like three years ago, but right, uh, right, right. Yeah. And so. Yeah, it, it feels very generic, and it, it, it feels a, a lot of, like, a smorgasbord of a lot of uh, Avengers stuff we've gotten in comics yeah. and movies and, and stuff. Uh, and, but and, it's interesting because of Kamala, 100%. And, and, don't, and I, I 100% agree with you, Bear. And don't, and don't get me wrong, the, ga the game looks good, the aesthetic is good, the character designs are fine. If the MCU didn't exist, nobody would be having this problem. It's because people are comparing it to the MCU, which, to be fair, is an unfair comparison. You can't, you can't match that. You shouldn't try to copy it. They're trying to do their own thing. Thing, but any any time you do at this point any kind of photorealistic of Avengers representation, people are going to go, yeah, but it ain't the but come on, MCU is the better version of that. And so they struggled, I think, with the initial public perception. And then the beta came out, and I got a code to play the beta, and I played it just because whatever, I'll check it out. But I went in very very skeptical, and I got to say, I had a blast with that beta. My my perceptions on the game totally changed. I enjoyed playing all of the characters equally. I felt like each character had a really, really fun move set. Um, and to your point, Barra, I totally agree with you. Kamala Khan is the, is is that game's secret weapon because it's a it, from a narrative perspective, it's a brilliant way to onboard characters into the world. You know, the outsider, right? Like the fangirl who doesn't know this world, who gets brought into the you know, into the out in, into the Avengers fold and has to have a bunch of stuff explained to her. Um, it's 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 a very very smart character for kind of the narrative onboarding, um, and also it's an area where there is no direct point of comparison to the MCU. They actually beat MCU to the punch here, right? Because they MCU haven't gotten around to Kamala Khan yet. I know they're working on it, but uh, but this is this is the first like real you know big like on screen version of that character, and she's a terrific character, and she deserves you know to to be brought in front of a wider audience. I, MCU will get there eventually, but in the meantime, I'm glad that that Square Enix. Uh, and Crystal Dynamics have, have, have made her front and center. She's so much fun to play too, right? With the stretchy arms and the big giant fists and stuff. She's just a hilarious, fun character to play. Um, but, you know, the, the, the and just across the board, I've just been really impressed with the writing is good. The voice acting is top notch. Uh, the campaign seems pretty solid. I haven't got very deep into it yet, but like I'm, I'm really, really enjoying it. And, you know, there's a bigger question about what's the, what's the long, what's the long term analysis of this game going to be because as we all know now when these games launch like as a service the day one release of the game is not the end of the story it's the beginning right like what's this game going to look like a year from now we don't know but for right now out of the box i am genuinely for me avengers especially if you're going if you're taking that first reveal as a starting point where everyone's like Ew, you know like you know again like cheap cheap version of mcu this doesn't look great to me um that they've I feel like they've completely turned that narrative around. For me, Avengers so far is like the is is like the biggest like the Fall Guys aside. Uh, to me, is like the big surprise package of the year. I'm really surprised how much I've enjoyed it so far. What about you guys? Wow, high praise, Baird. I'll kick it over to you quickly. Tell me what are your thoughts and impressions if you've played it so far. Uh, so I, I don't think I've gotten to where you are, Mike, because I think you've been the campaign and are, are starting to look at the kind of post campaign content. Um, I'm roughly in the area where the the beta kind of took place like uh, i'm a it's not a huge spoiler that like uh throughout the game you're unlocking and introducing yourself to new characters so we're about to meet up with tony stark so i'm still like pretty early on like maybe two hours mm. in um just because like that specific segment of the game and i felt this way with the the beta and i'm so it, I'm super shocked that uh, this was the part of the game that they showed off in the the, um, the beta testing is just like a very slow. You're, you're kind of going back and forth between uh, Kamala and Hulk. And I think Hulk is a terrible, like just a terrible feeling character to play as. Um, oh, I enjoy playing as the Hulk smash. Uh, you get to I smash think, things. I, I, it might've been the choice to make him feel clunky as hell, but he feels clunky as hell and I just do not enjoy it. Um, and so, but I, I really love the stuff narratively and I, I don't know if I'm really going to hold on to this after the, uh, like 
uh, credits roll and stuff like that. But I'm I'm fine with this being just like a, from what I'm seeing, like a a, a good ten hour Avengers story, and I'm totally fine with that. I right now I'm not feeling the need to get into all the post game multiplayer kind of stuff. But we'll see. I, I I might feel differently by the end of it. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely not as hardcore as Greg Miller is about it. Um, but I am really enjoying it, and like I will say, it's like it is my biggest surprise this year. I would say because like if you'd asked me three months ago, I was I would have told you like oh no like there's no way i'm gonna like this game and i'm i am enjoying it so i i, I will say that I'll, I'll give it credit where credit is due what about you i like Mike? both of you guys' insights of course i'll go last i have beaten the story and i've completed the campaign now i'm looking towards multiplayer and what we call in the games as a service mantra and game content right and so when i look back on it i think man i had a really good time right that was a fun popcorn flick action story where Kamala was put as the centerpiece and I got to buy into a new character I never knew about in the MCU, right? And I felt for this girl. I loved how she grew. I loved how she evolved. And I loved the people around her buying into, hey, we're the Avengers. Who's this new girl? Oh, wait, now she's, you know, working hard for us. We're liking this and she's part of the fold. I really like the story. Gameplay, you know, it's just another smash, smash, heavy attack block, counter, do your special abilities. It feels like that kind of game. My biggest gripe, it, it, actually... It feels very um, uh, surface level. Really quick, Gary, are you meaning to cosplay as the, the Incredible Hulk right now? Because your camera's all wonky in Discord. <laughs> oh, we got oh, a man, Why Why my camera? I don't know. If oh, you're watching right weird. now on YouTube, we have now hulked out Gary Whitta. He's gonna <laughs> he's gonna fix that while I tell That's you so really weird. quick. My right, biggest downfall, Barrett and Gary, is the ranged and or shooting mechanic i think it feels clunky whenever mm. i'm playing as any of these characters you can tell there is a big focus on melee combat right with your special abilities and your light and heavy attacks when you go into ranged and have to take down a turret or you just want to range nothing it doesn't feel quite right because you bring it up with your left trigger and it kind of stops everything and mm. then you kind of throw it or you're slow to move around it doesn't feel as fluid as I would like, and maybe that's me coming from a first-person shooter genre, heavy gameplay style that I usually am in, mm -hmm. but that ranged attack feels wonky, and I don't like it. But I'll say, all in all, the game is a lot of fun, right? It's a good Avengers story. It has some solid gameplay, but the biggest one for me and how I'm going to bring it all back to Xbox for all of our audience out there and to get them in the conversation is, is this game is touted as a games-as-a-service with your favorite superheroes and gosh darn it, y'all, it feels like a games as a service. And you're probably saying to yourself in your car, watching on the big screen, you're like, yeah, I know that feeling, Mike, or I know what that looks like. I know how that feels. And so I said to myself, I started wondering, well, what do my XCast co-hosts consider a games as a service? Because I think there's a really big gray area or a wide range that we all can look at and say, that's a games as a service or that's just a full product. So I said, what do my co-hosts think of it? And on top of that, are Xbox Game Studios trending towards this gaming direction for us, or are they already hitting games as service right now in our first-party portfolio? So we're going to have a fun game right now. We're going to keep it very basic. Barrett and Gary, I just want you to say yes or no if you think a game is a games as a service. That's mm -hmm. what I'm going to go through just right now. Of course, if you're listening or if you're sitting there watching, say yes or no and start thinking about it in your mind. So here's some titles for you to no, think about. No, really quick. If you're driving, we're going to do the whole Greg Miller thing. If you're driving your car, roll down your window, and whenever oh, you answer you something, yell it out of your window, so the other drivers around you know what your thoughts are for each of these games. Love that. Destiny. Yes. Gary, yes or no on Destiny? Is it a games as a service? Oh yeah, of course. It's like it's, it's like okay. the granddaddy of them all. Yeah, it's the one that basically defined that genre. The Division. Yes. yes. World of Warcraft. Yes. Don't know enough. <laughs> Avengers. Yes. Remains okay. to be seen, but it seems like that's what they're going for. It's a little early to say, right? But yeah. Let's keep it going. How about Fortnite? Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a different format, but yes. Warzone? Yeah. Yeah. Apex? Yeah. Yeah. GTA Online? Yeah. Yeah. League of Legends? Yeah. Don't know enough. Hey, so everybody's getting there. We had some yeses. We've had some iffies where you could go back and forth. Let's talk Xbox now. Sea of Thieves? 
Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It, I mean, it feels like a largely semantic argument, right? It's like again, like the, the, the definition of like what what a game, what is a game as a service that is old Gary, being redefined all the time. In just a moment, grounded. He's building, he's building to something here. I I'm feel building. Like. Oh, something oh, oh, here. Okay, Mike's going somewhere with it. Okay. <laughs> Grounded. This, this is like the scene in the courtroom where the judge is like, you better be going <laughs> somewhere with this. Now it's grounded. Uh, uh, haven't played it enough to know. Yeah, I don't know. Flight Sim. No. no. Only a couple more here. Minecraft? Yeah. I don't know enough, I guess, but I my instinct is to say no, but I there is a format there, I think, but I don't think it's as uh, cash grabby as games as a service usually are. Uh, that's our a final two. Minecraft Dungeon? No. No. Bleeding Edge. Don't know that one. That's the that's the, like the new hero shooter kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Game I out. I don't know. Ninja enough. Theory. Small game. Oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah, only. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know enough. Okay. So I just took you through some definites, some maybes, and then some Xbox games that we've seen released recently. So, to st start this all off, give me just your baseline opinion on what is a games as a service in your mind, and also, do you like games as a service? So, Gary, I'll kick it over to you because I know you got an answer here. What what makes a games as a service to you? I mean, again, what are some it, of the it, key it, identifiers. It's 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 a, it's a squishy definition because games as a service is a relatively new concept, not in the MMO space. Like you said, when you mentioned World of Warcraft. MMOs have been around for a long time, but they are technically also a game as a service. I would say that if the game is basically kind of an ongoing living entity where it's constantly evolving and they're constantly delivering, if, if, if it's a game that basically lives online and requires you to be, you know, part of a persistent, you know, evolving world, and that and that world is constantly being evolved through new content and you know when you come back to the game three months from now like it's basically a different experience um and it's essentially monetized through some kind of subscription or microtransactions rather than just hey you buy the one you buy this game and own it forever i guess that's currently what i think of as a game as a service but again i think it's largely semantics and it's a hard thing to put a label on because it's you know what it, this is a relatively new outside of the mmo space you've been thinking about anthem and fortnite um, and and Avengers and Destiny. This is a relatively new kind of hybrid genre and a relatively new way of monetizing and delivering a game to audiences. And a lot of developers and publishers and audiences are still trying to figure out what the hell this even is. Like there's a whole new, this is why I think Anthem struggled and why a lot of games as services struggled. It's like this is uncharted territory in the in the video game design space. This is a new area. How do we keep this fresh? How do we make it interesting? How do we monetize it in a way that doesn't feel like a cash grab? These are all questions that that we're seeing developers and publishers answer, you know, and, and explore and figure out like live in an ongoing public process in front of us. And we're seeing them make mistakes. We're seeing them go down blind alleys, seeing, you know, try things that aren't working. And slowly but surely, you know, the, the game community is, is going to hone in on how to make this work. Like, you know, one company see, oh, that works in this other game. Let's borrow that. That's, that's a winning approach. They've proven that that can work. We should do something like that. And we're seeing that, you know, the division or whatever, when, when, or, or Avengers comes out, they're clearly looking at, you know, the destiny and the games that have come before and, and, you know, standing on the shoulders of those games and figuring out what they can, what they can learn and do differently. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it, you know, much like the games themselves, the genre, the overall genre of games as a service is a constantly kind of living, evolving, growing, uh, entity. And we're not, I, I personally, even though we've seen some really, really big failures in this space, Anthem probably being the, the, the most spectacular public one. Um, I, I personally believe that the, 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 that, that format, that essential idea can work and can be really exciting and interesting as someone who played World of Warcraft for many years persistent worlds living you know spaces where you get to get to go hang out with your friends on an ongoing permanent basis and the content's always being kept fresh by you know new dlc and expansions and that's it's, it's fun it's really when they get it right it could work really really well i i think that we are going to get there we're just that we because it's a it's a it's an emergent genre and we're seeing a lot of experimentation not all of it's successful there's there's a lot of failures, a lot of frustrations out there, but I do think that as we learn and grow collectively as a community of developers, publishers, and audiences alike, we'll we'll, we'll get to a place where games as a service 
isn't a dirty word as it currently is right now. Okay, Gary, some very thoughtful stuff right there. Flip it over to Barrett. Barrett, just your baseline thoughts on this? Games, and games and service, service is dumb and bad, and we should all hate it. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think uh, Gary kind of hit the nail on the head. And, like, for me personally, like, it, the baseline of what I think of as games as a service, which I'll just say right now, I fucking... I, I hate that that's the name for this genre. I don't It's. I don't think it's a very fitting name, but whatever. Um to me, it feels like a an online uh, multiplayer RPG uh, that is designed around uh, getting you to come into it every single day with uh, constant updates, uh, new missions that feel the same over and over again, but they're in different locations and maybe a different skin of enemy, um, and also designed around um, getting you to, to pay for micro, microtransaction stuff. Um, and so, yeah, like, uh, I was recently thinking about this a lot because when, uh, Gotham Knights was revealed, a lot of people were like, ah, it's games as a service. It's games as a service. Uh, there's co-op in it. And I, I, I kept trying to tell people like, just because there's optional co-op, which they, all they said was there's optional co-op doesn't make it a games as a service type of game. Uh, they like also had to, uh, WB Montreal was like, Hey, it's an action based, uh, uh, open world RPG that has a optional co-op. And that's all that we're describing it, uh, as right now, there might be some games as a service stuff that's added in later, but, uh, I think th- their kind of intent with that design is just it's an open world RPG with some uh, optional co-op. And so, yeah, I, I think people themselves get confused of what a games as a service game is as well. Um, whenever there's like a, something that's added with like multiplayer in a game that you want to be single player, it's automatically games as a service. But I don't think just because there's online like an online capability doesn't mean that it's a it's a games as a service there's a specific kind of like design work around um uh like weekly updates and uh like uh seasonal events and and stuff like that that uh speaks to me as a a a games as a service and like gary said it's very much what um mmos have uh known to do for a very long time it's just being implemented now in first person shooters and action games and and stuff like that and not just like kind of uh, kind of point and click like online uh, worlds and shit like that, right? So we both- yeah, I mean, ma- massively multiplayer online games sounds better than game as games as a service. Right? Games <laughs> as a service sounds like something you'd see on a spreadsheet at like a marketing meeting. It's yeah. a, it's not. It, I mean, maybe, maybe it just need you know they, they do have a lot of work to do on the creative and implementation side, but maybe they just need to rebrand what these games are. Call them like persistent games or live games or something that feels more. Mm-hmm. You know, coming from a place of this is cool rather than this is this is this is the manner in which we're monetizing this game. That doesn't sound, when you just it's use, not consumer facing. <laughs> when you just use the initials, it essentially just spells out gas, which like when you see that you're like, ew. <laughs> you just wanted to go like, oh gross. So like, yeah, it's not the best I don't think it's the best name, and I don't think it every time it deserves as much hate as it does. It, like, yeah, there's like bad implementation. Listen, um, no, nobody wanted to eat Patagonian toothfish, so they ch- they changed it to Chilean sea bass and they, now they can charge 30 bucks for it. Like branding, exactly, branding exactly. is a big deal, but you, you can call it whatever you want. People are not going to respond to this genre until they start getting it right. And we are getting closer. Division 2, I thought, got, was, it, was, it, was a really good example. Does it still have issues? Yeah, again, this is a new type of gaming, just like VR, right? We're in this unexplored space and we're, we're kind of feeling around for the edges and you know, you're never really going to go. A lot of this is like, it's just experimentation, right? It's like, okay, you, okay, this didn't work. Let's not try that again. But, but, but because of, here's the thing, they don't get to test a lot of this stuff in private like they do with a single player game with an internal army of testers. Some of this stuff can only really be properly tested when you actually deploy it to a live user base. And so you'll get so a lot of those failures are going to be very public failures. But that's how we learn. That's how we that's how we get better at making games. We are still in kind of the silent movie era of quote unquote games as a service, where like we're still figuring out how to use the tools, how to make it work. And and we're we're gonna we're gonna get better uh over time. And I and I do think that it's that it's a valid genre. It's it's fun, you know, persistent, evolving, ever-growing worlds where you get to check in with your friends. Um, and, and play online together. It's that's a, a fun thing that we all like to do. But it all comes down to how well can it be implemented. And again, what's what, and again, what's the offering? How do they monetize it? Can they do this in a way? Because um, it's expensive to run these servers, right? And they need they, these games need to make money. 
But you know, whether that's through a regular uh, subscription, I mean, don't forget, this is the other big difference. I mean, like World of Warcraft, you pay a monthly subscription to play. Destiny, you don't, right? They monetize that a different way. They'll sell you the game out of the box initially, uh, and then they'll charge you for like the big, you know, DLC updates and stuff like that. But you don't pay, any, you're not paying any kind of monthly subscription. Can you imagine if how much everyone would shit the bed if Active Bungie came out and said, oh yeah, it's 10 bucks a month to play Destiny now? But that's the norm in the MMO space. And so, you know, again, there's a couple of things that, that they're going to continue to experiment with. One is the creative. How do, how, do we make, how do we make these online persistent live games um, fun and, you know, not just, a, not just a repetitive grindy gameplay loop? Because that's an issue that they're dealing with right now as well. Uh, you know, go hit 10 of these things and I'll give you a slightly better pair of trousers. Yeah, yeah not, which I think right? is going to be a huge challenge for Avengers specifically because I think right. half of that game is a single player game where you're leveling up different characters and stuff. And then when you get to the, the multiplayer side of it and the end game content kind of stuff, it, it is it does feel very games as a service. -y. You got your battle passes, separate battle passes for each character. Um, and it's all like a very interesting design work of like, is that really going to keep people uh, coming back? Because at the core of it, there are games as a service type of games that work because the gameplay is fun. Um, like I'm not huge into multiplayer games, but I stuck on to Destiny 2 way longer than I thought I would. I thought I would stay with that game for like a week and then just kind of write it off. But like I, I stayed with that game for a while because I think Destiny 2 did a good job. Um, I don't know if that's a, a an unpopular opinion uh, is usually my opinions are. Uh, <laughs> but that that's what it, it works for me there. And uh, there are some other things that like don't work for me as much. I, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a totally different gameplay challenge in a single player game. The challenge is how can we keep the player engaged for 10 20 30 hours and then they're done with these new games these new type these live persistent games it's how do how do we keep players interested and engaged for hundreds and thousands of hours because that's you know if we're going to keep putting these servers up we need people to keep coming back destiny i played until kind of the end game and raid level and then i just got bored and i've never never gone back there's a lot you know you see a lot of drop off after players hit like you know what they perceive to be the end of like the original content and then you just get on that regurgitative gameplay loop and a lot of people aren't, aren't excited about that repetitive nature of the gameplay all right so both of you now have kind of a baseline you know everybody out in the audience has thought of what they think is a games as a service or where they draw the line some things to keep in mind of battle passes free to play microtransactions multiplayer only constant updates dlc weekly or daily missions just some things to keep in your back of your mind but to turn it more towards xbox right now as we look towards the future of Xbox first party games, could we see them lean into games as a service model for the following? Gary and Barrett, can you imagine a games as a service with Forza Motorsports now dropping the number? Do we think that this racing title will become a games as a service? I could see it uh, if they're dropping the number and they kind of like want the new game to be seen more as a platform. I could see that. Yeah, maybe. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I with a very, a very specific game style like driving, it's hard to see. Having said that, I didn't think there was, I, I didn't think there was much um, uh, latitude for battle royale outside of shooters. And then Tetris ninety nine and Fall Guys came along, and we saw that. And now there's a Mario battle royale, and suddenly you realize that that and battle some of the best battle royales, <laughs> and, and, and some of the most interesting iterations of the battle royale concepts. And so, the, the designers are constantly surprising us. Yeah, I. I don't see any, I'm open-minded, I don't see any reason why, for example, you couldn't do a really great persistent live um, uh, driving world. I give, mean, we, we give me a Forza bat battle, uh, battle, battle Royale, Royale right? You have a Forza Battle Royale, but when I oh, think yeah. of this, when we talk about, yeah, you have to check that out, the Eliminator mode, incredible. Um, but what I think about is we've had this constant conversation about sports titles, right? And how year after year, they try to iterate, they try to elevate, and what we really see is, roster changes and very small minute detail changes and sometimes just a copy and paste over certain areas of the game like we see in madden 20 right now with or madden 21 with madden 19 things yep. sticked on it so the question becomes is like could forza do this totally right i think this is what we as gamers want right like i'm sick of paying 60 dollars every single year for something i can barely tell the difference of and with forza right this could become that games of service that could become that platform of Hey, we're just going to constantly update you with cars, tracks, different decals, different microtransactions, and maybe even make it the platform where Forza Horizon gets in integrated into it. But I think as we look at the Xbox first-party titles, 
Forza dropping the number might mean us might have us look at is this going to become a games of service? And in that sports genre, I think it's ripe for the idea of turning that in. How about we look at Halo Infinite, guys? Now well, they're touting I, this as a platform, Gary. What do you when, think about when, Halo when Infinite? When they announced the title Halo Infinite, my first assumption was they're going in that direction. And I and I, I if not with this game, I think I think they will eventually end up in that direction. I think they probably made the decision, again, going back to my earlier point, that game, I hesitate to call it this because I don't think it's a good name, but it's it, you know, it's what we all know it as. That games as a service isn't a mature enough genre yet for them to probably feel like they they would they would like throw all of the, their Halo chips in. The, they're not going to put all their chips in the middle on that in case it, in case it doesn't work. But like as we get better at this and we see Avengers and Destiny and you know what are, whatever this new Resurrection Anthem is going to be that they're placing a big bet on, if they can get to it, if we get to a point in the future where okay, yeah, games is a thing. This is cool now. It actually works. We basically cracked the essential you know dynamics of it. We know how to make them good. At that point, yeah, I think Halo will come into that space. I just don't think they want to be the first one out on the dance floor in terms of like the Halo is not, I don't think Halo is a franchise that they feel that they can afford to take tremendous risks with. I think they're going to continue to play it safe uh, with Halo for the time being. I may be wrong. I think maybe the way to do it with Halo Infinite is like, yeah, have the single player campaign, have everything that you expect, but like maybe maybe there's like a, a an, an additional mode that allows them to kind of put their toe in the water and dabble with some kind of live persistent world or something. I, I, I think there's a lot of potential there. When you think about how much world building there is in the Halo universe, they can they can dive into all of that and do some really really um, interesting stuff. I do think you'll see. It. I, I I don't think you'll see it. You know, all in on this next iteration of of, of Halo, if and when you know it ever comes out. Um, but I, I I do think that in, if you're looking at the long term future of Halo, there will absolutely be some manifestation of of an ongoing persistent Halo world. Barrett, I'm going to pose this question to you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Halo used the word platform instead of games as a service because they would be too afraid to be identified next to Destiny or The Division and have you think, oh, well, I'm just going to choose my own made-up Spartan and we're going to make, we're going to play it like Avengers where I'm constantly leveling up different gear, I'm getting new guns. Do you think they were worried about putting games as a service next to it because the first thought we would think of is Destiny? Yeah, I think uh, I think specifically Destiny, just because Bungie was uh, was the Halo team, and the, they went on to to make Destiny, and you know, three four three has been kind of in the shadow of Bungie ever since they've taken over Halo, uh, and so I, I think yeah, that specific wording, wording, I think we can you know we're. It, we'll have to wait and see what the, the the final product looks like and what they actually mean as a a platform. But yeah, I, I think it was them trying to um, get a little bit away uh, just from that uh, that idea, um, just to not be compared uh, again and again and again to Bungie. But we'll see. Uh, they they might mean it in a different way. They might mean it in a in a way where. Um, they they add more story content to it uh, throughout the years, and uh, like this is just like the the one Halo where you get uh, your story content for for a while. That that might be it, uh, but it, more likely than not, it's probably with uh, with multiplayer stuff and how people are playing with each other online and and all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, we'll have to see. When you think about it, Halo is the easiest one to imagine because Bungie basically did it right. The Halo developers went off and made another game, Destiny which is a very Halo-like shooter with, you know, a very similar kind of arcane, somewhat impenetrable mythology. And I, I remember playing a lot of, the, 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 when I first played a lot of Destiny 1 and 2, I was like, man, this really feels and looks and just seems a lot like Halo. It's not, doesn't seem terribly different. Now, I know there are lots of Destiny and Halo fans out there ripping their fucking hair out because I don't know the difference between this purple <laughs> enemy and that purple <laughs> enemy. But like to, 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 to a casual player, they're not that different. They, you know, the, the the gameplay is very similar. It's a first-person shooter set on an alien world, and there's like these weird alien races that you're fighting, and you've got like superpowers and stuff. It's not that difficult. So it's it's tremendous. It's not difficult difficult to imagine taking exactly what Destiny is and mapping exactly that game style into the Halo universe, and then you've got Halo, you know, Infinite or Halo Persistent, you know, Halo Universe, whatever you want to call it. Like it's not difficult to imagine. Yeah, it's really fun, Gary and Bear, to imagine what Halo Infinite as a quote-unquote platform will be, but also to now say, well, does that mean games as a service? And then 
what is a games as a service to you, right? Is it a battle pass? Is it the constant update? Is it the loot grinding gear where you constantly level up to the max level and then wait for the next season? It'll be fun to imagine that. Of course, when I first heard platform with Halo Infinite, my mind went to like the farthest reaches of like, they're going to take the Master Chief collection, put it in with Halo Infinite. We'll just be one package with all the Halos. They'll update the Halo Infinite campaign with new stuff, but they'll put it all together. That's probably not going to happen. But it looks like, could we see a games as a service? Will we see a battle pass? Will we see new seasonal updates to that campaign, that open world that it's being touted as all the time and make this a games as a service? What does platform mean? But a big one there, especially with one of the biggest releases coming up. The final two I have for you is, let's talk about Everwild. Everwild, we have no idea what this game is. We're still speculating on it after multiple showings now. And we know that Rare just came out with Sea of Thieves. That is a games as a service. We've seen it go from a shaky launch to a great reception over the months and years now into a good game. Do we think the same for Everwild, Gary Witta? I mean, like you said, I mean, the key point is we don't know anything about it, do we? We, we know literally nothing about it. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold judgment on that one. I like Rare. Um, it looks interesting. But again, that teaser trailer showed us almost nothing. Who the hell knows? I just, I got nothing for you on this one, really. Nothing of substance. Barrett, I'm sure you're probably the same way, right? Uh, pulling from the trailer, I, I, I get kind of similar vibes of, uh, um, again, we don't know what the gameplay, like we barely know what the fuck this game is about. Uh, but I think uh, just what they were showcasing of like uh, characters hanging out with each other and uh, doing their own thing. Like I wouldn't be surprised if this is another uh, kind of uh, live service uh, kind of situation as uh, Sea of Thieves. Um but yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with Gary that it's too early to tell if it'll be like a one-to-one -one of how they uh, built Sea of Thieves and how they kind of designed around that whole um, kind of multiplayer uh, stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll see, uh, hopefully in the, the coming year, um, just because it's always exciting to uh, see a, a new rare game and see what they're up to. Yeah, what about, fun. you know, I don't know if you want to throw this one out there, Mike, but what about Fable going Ooh. into that space? Whoa, Gary, I wasn't going to bring it up, but Gary, since you brought it up, I could definitely see Fable doing this, right? Like, as we talk about his Xbox first-party titles from Xbox Game Studios leaning into this, would we really do it to Fable? Could we do it to Fable? I, I think mean, 100% you could. I, I still don't know why there isn't, like, one really great flagship MMO on the consoles, the way that, you know, World of Warcraft dominates in the, on the PC space. Where, where's the great, like, console-based MMO? And why couldn't Fable be that? You know, it's it's got that, it, you know, it's got the it's already got the idea of like persistence and you know a world that kind of grows and evolves around you, even in the single player uh, I, uh, you know space. So why not take that and 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 blow it up and and come up with like like I I I I want to I can't play World of Warcraft anymore because it almost destroyed me. But like I want I I I want that feeling of like let's check it again. This idea of like let, let's let, let me go check back into that world. You know, the feeling that even when you switch the game off, the world persists. It's kind of a cool, comforting feeling to know there's this other place you can always escape to and your friends might be hanging out there. We've seen this conversation evolving a lot over the last uh, couple of years as we talk about, you know, the emergence of the metaverse and, you know, uh, Fortnite players, in, you know, increasingly, uh, young kids increasingly thinking of Fortnite, not just as a game that they go online and play, but a space that they go to and they visit. And, you know, Fortnite is a world that they go to to hang out with their friends. I, I love that idea, and I can see why it's so compelling to so many people. I When I played World of Warcraft, I loved that, like, I'm going to go to this other place now and be this other person and hang out with my guildmates and my friends. Um, and World of Warcraft was like this whole other life that I had for a long time. I kind of want that again in the console space, and I think that the, 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 the games as a service kind of get us halfway there, but, like, the MMO is, like, the, really the full evolution of that experience. And I know there's, like, Fantasy Star and, you know, the, and... Um, uh, you know, there are other games out there in the MMO space on, you know, it's not that there aren't any MMOs on console, but we've never seen like the one big one that's like, oh yeah, like that's that that's that's the one that everyone plays. Like that's that's the flagship one. I kind of feel like there's a big opportunity there. And I and, and again, Fable, and I just kind of feel like the world is is made uh for, you know to have that kind of potential, possibly. Gary, you made me smile there because you know our other co-host who's down for the count right now due to being ill, Alana. Is a huge Fable player, so I'm sure she's going to have some spicy words and takes for us. I'd be interested to hear what she would think about that. Yeah. That it could ever do it. But I'll give you one more on the speculation train for all our Xbox fans out there. As we see the growth and the development of State of Decay 
from one into two. Could we see stated decay three take a hard left turn and really open up this world with a massive amount of players become a games of service? I think that would be very interesting to me to get me into state of decay more and to want to play it weekly, daily, monthly, and check out all the cool stuff. I think that lends a great idea for the zombie, the apocalypse. I think the player, I think the base building, I think that could be really fun as a games of service. Barrett, state of decay. Do you think we could see three take a, a hard left turn into that kind of alley? I don't know enough to, about State of Decay, to be honest there. So I, I don't think I can really comment. But um, I, I feel like I was – when did State of Decay 2 come out? When did that come out? Was that – Sometime last year. I, know, I, I, pl I played a bit of it last year. It didn't stick with me. But I did I, I did like it. Two. Um, this was 2018. So, yeah, I think okay. I played a little bit of State of Decay 2 for, like, capture for IGN. Um, and from what I remember, like I could, I could see it, but uh, like, I, I don't think they would, I don't know. It, again, I don't, I don't know much, too much about it, but, uh, like I could see in like the design of what that game is, they, they, they might be able to do that, but I don't know if they'll as, actually as, go that route. As a PC gamer, I do think there's potential in this space, the kind of the survival, survivalist, you know, space. If you think about games like DayZ and Rust that are very, very popular on the PC side that are all based on this, like, just don't fucking die. Just stay alive. Like, you know, and they make and they make it really hard for you. This is actually a, quite a mature genre on the PC side. Um, you know, these like, you know, brutal kind of hardcore survival type games that happen in an on online persistent world and, you know, you're trying to sleep one night and, you know, some other player comes along and like fucking janks you and kills you and takes all your shit. Um, it's, 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 there's a lot, a lot of work's already been done in exploring the kind of design possibilities of this kind of game on the PC side. I think it's only a matter of time before you see the lessons that are being learned from games like Daisy and, and Rust. And there are many others I'm, I'm, I'm failing to think about. Go to Steam and there's like a hundred of these games that people are trying right now. Um, and we're learning a lot very quickly about those about that kind of um, uh, persistent online live service game. Only a matter of time, I think, before you see that breakthrough on, on, on the console side. All right. Guys, we've had a great conversation. I hope you out there listening have had some fun. Let's wrap it up with one final question. So now looking back on the conversation we just had, we've talked about games as services. We've talked about what we think is a games as service. We've seen that there's a big spectrum of what others could consider that, right? And so now as we look forward, we know that Microsoft has a vast diverse offerings with their first party studios, the Xbox Game Studios. And now we know Microsoft is blazing a new path for a different approach to gaming unlike we've ever seen before. Do we think, Gary Witta and Barrett, that this is the right business move for Microsoft to lean into these styles of games that could possibly work best in a Game Pass subscription-based model. Meaning, do you think giving all of our first-party games away, you know, under the subscription for free, right? I put quotes there, you know, day and dates, no extra charge. Do you think that they should lean more into games as a service to try to get more out of your wallet? So not only are they getting the subscription, but they're also getting more money out through this game. Or do you think we'll see this trend kind of die off what do you think, Gary Witter? I think that Microsoft is, it's, a, it's obviously a core plank of their strategy right now that they're interested in making Game Pass as irresistible an offering as, as possible, right? They, they want to keep like, anything they can do. They're willing to, willing to sink a ton of money and make a ton of investment in like every, every time they can like add a, like a value add to Game Pass. And you also get this and you also get that. They're going to do it. And so maybe one way to do that is, let's say, for example, that they did um, uh, announced that the next generation of Halo is now going to be like a persistent live world that you can check in and out of and the game evolves over time and there's constant content. If they said to you, hey, with a Game Pass subscription, all of that, you know, basically every DLC pack, every evolution, every expansion, that all gets folded into the, into the Game Pass subscription and you're never going to pay any, like your Game Pass subscription basically covers you and, they get, and there's a way that the economics of that would work out on their end. What a compelling you know, offer, offer that would be. Whoa, Gary, I didn't think of including it. I thought they would try to take money from me and get that money that I didn't spend already on the game. That's an interesting one. Like we see with Destiny coming up right now. Is I mean, that maybe you need, maybe friendly? you need That's like fucking Game one. Pass Platinum or some bullshit that they'll roll out or something. But you know, 20, but now it's 20 bucks a month, but you get all these extra, you get all these extra features, you know, like basically you're, you're like, you're, you're, 
like you could you could buy a bespoke like Halo Infinite subscription or Battle Pass or whatever. But if there's like maybe there's a new tier of Game Passes, yeah, you get all that shit thrown in as well. Like again, yeah. we talked about but like simplify the offering. One subscription to rule them all. Get Game Pass fucking titanium or whatever their marketing department comes up with, and it's like you know, ne- and you never spend another dollar on anything that we bring you, even and you know, including you know DLC expansions, content drops for all our first party games. That could be interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting one because when we look back, right, we see Destiny getting everything included. We see a couple of first party games get everything included, but then when we look out at the outer worlds. That second DLC or that first DLC coming out right now, you have to pay for it. It's not included on Game Pass. So there's like a moment here where we draw the line where, you know, some things are, some things aren't. Barrett, do you think this is the right business move for Xbox maybe to lean into games of service to try to get more money out of you throughout the future of those microtransactions? You know, does this help them? I think it depends on the the quality of what we see in the future of uh, depending on like what games we see they make as a games as service and what the quality of the the games themselves are. Uh, I, I, if they feel like they nail it, uh, like if if Halo Infinite ends up being like a, a little more games as a service as maybe some people want, uh, but they feel like uh, they see that keeping like the the cash flow coming in and they they think they are confident in the design of that. I think they could lean into it um, because, it, you know, like they love their subscription service type of stuff. And I, I think they could find a way to do that with more of their games and feel confident and feel like they're um, like, it's worth uh, putting in that effort um, right now. I, I, I think it's a little too early to tell. Cause I, although we, you did bring up a bunch of examples of uh, uh, different games that have already come out that are a little more games as a service. Um, I, they haven't had that, like, I feel like that juggernaut that really proves to them that they can pull it off. So, again, I think it's a little too early to to say right now. I love that. Thank you both for having some fun. A great conversation on a Friday. But, really, I want to hear from you, all my best friends around the globe that are watching and listening. Right now, I want to know, do you think that Microsoft is on a trend to have more games and services on their first-party platform? Do you think that games as a service Is the right trend? Is that what you want to be behind? An ever-persisting living world. And on the flip side, if Xbox was to create one juggernaut game that is the killer games as service, what would that game be? Let me know in the comments below. Shoot me a tweet. Have some fun. It was an awesome Friday conversation. Just kicking back, hanging with Barrett and Gary. Shout out to Alana. We hope she gets better. And that is the Kind of Funny X-Cast for episode eight. It's your guy Snowbike Mike with Barrett and Gary saying thank you so much for listening. And let us know in the comments below what you think those thoughts are on Games as a Service. See ya.